The book of Daniel is first about faithfulness. Our choosing to be faithful to the Lord regardless of what happens. And the second great theme of Daniel is what will happen. So both of these are important themes. And as we move back and forth between these themes throughout the book, we we are shown the life that we ought to live, how we are supposed to live, and also what is going to happen. In Daniel chapter 9, as we dive into this new chapter, we're going to see that the first section is a prayer of confession. And Daniel is going to submit himself as well as the people of Israel uh, and throw them upon the mercy of God, seeking his promises that he has he has promised, acknowledging that he has done justly and that uh, now it is time for mercy. We are, each of us in our own state of chaos in our countries and here in the United States is absolutely the same is that we have done all sorts of wickedness and deserve judgment as a nation. And we too should be crying out for mercy. So we're going to have a serious time of, uh, of prayer today. As we read through this prayer, we need to learn how to pray like this. And one of the things I want you to keep in mind as we look at this passage is, do I pray like this? Does this sound like me? Or do maybe we need to learn a little more about prayer ourselves? Before we dive into this passage to learn about prayer, let's pray uh, to seek God's guidance. And uh, so glad to have you along for the ride here today. Um, Let us know down in the comments down below uh, your thoughts as as we go through this and uh, things that you see in the passage as well. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to what you have to to say to us today. As we see the godly example of Daniel interceding before your throne, seeking your mercy, he doesn't defend himself or the people, but rather acknowledges the the failures, acknowledges how right you have been. Lord, help us to agree with you, but Lord, help us not to fail to plead with you as well. Lord, you delight in those who intercede on behalf of others, for those who delight in mercy. Lord, help us to be those people. We pray these things in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. All right, we're going to be in Daniel chapter 9. We're going to cover the first half here. Uh, There is another half uh, that you'll kind of catch a glimpse of which is uh, the another prophecy, a big prophecy, one that, honestly, if you've never heard of this before, will blow your minds, uh, because Daniel is essentially going to pre- predict when the Messiah, when Jesus was going to um, enter into Jerusalem, when he was going to present himself as the king of the Jews. And uh, the numbers are pretty wild on that. Actually gives you a date of when Jesus was supposed to show up. You know, people are like, they were waiting and they were wondering when it would happen. If they did the math right, Daniel told them when it was going to happen. Absolutely crazy, right? Um, But today, knowing what's going to happen is is so unimportant compared to how we live our lives. We're going to stand before the throne of God and give an answer for every idle word, every way that we've behaved, everything that we've done, everything we haven't done. We're going to give an account to the Lord for how we behave in this lifetime. We're not going to give an account to the Lord of whether we were right or not in our uh, understanding of the prophecies. I understand we all we all have curiosity. We all want to know. But how we live is what makes us the sum total of who we are the choices that we live. So let's see where we are here. Daniel chapter 9, verse 1, the first king of Darius. Now, Darius, once again, is, uh, he's a, as it says, a Mede by birth. Uh, He's of the Medes and Persians. They take over after the Babylonians. Babylonians raid and pillage Jerusalem, bring Daniel out. 
And then the Babylonians fall to the Medes and Persians. And that's Cyrus the second or Cyrus the great. And then he has a son who takes over. And then under after him, Darius decides to um, weasel his way into the throne. Uh, apparently, he may have killed Cyrus's son uh, in order to, to take the throne. Uh, we don't have firm conclusion on that, but uh, the historical documents are kind of silent on that. <laughs> it seems It seems like that was covered up, but... Darius, he's a Mede. Uh, the Medes are the secondary. They're the, they're the weaker side of this partnership, the Medes and the Persians. The Persians are much stronger. So he's already kind of on the, the weaker side of things. But uh, it says, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahu, Ahu, Ahu sorry, Ahu, swear, <laughs> I'm missing a, vow, uh, a consonant here. Ahu's. I, I can hear it in my head, but I can't make it out. Um, Ahasuerus. <laughs> We're all working on it, right? Ahasuerus. Yeah, that sounds better. That sounds better. Uh, Ahasuerus. That's, I'm pretty sure that's correct. Um, a Mede by birth who is made king over the Chaldean kingdom <laughs> in his first year of his reign. I, Daniel, understood from the books, according to the word of the Lord to the prophet Jeremiah, that the number of years for the desolation of, Jeremiah, uh, of Jerusalem would be 70, 70 years. Um, so I turned my attention to the Lord to seek him by prayer and petitions with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. So God, through the prophet Jeremiah, gave, gave how many years it was going to be that, the, uh, that Jerusalem would be uh, lie desolate. And we're going to see towards the end of this chapter, God's going to give another number to Daniel about what's going to happen going forward. God is in control of everything. But also Daniel was not just, you know, waiting for a vision, looking up at the sky. He was reading God's book. He was in the word of God, right? He was getting into the word of God and he was seeing what God said. And that's important, right? Some people, they pray that God will give them a vision about big things to come of what's going on there. They eat all the pizza they can so they can have more dreams. Uh, they want extra biblical revelations. But where did Daniel start? One of the greatest prophets of all time uh, who had visions and he started at the word of God and looking for what God had already promised and what God had already revealed. And he read it out and said, there it is, 70 years. And why 70 years? Well, in Jeremiah, we're, we're told that the reason why I have 70 years was uh, the Jews are supposed to rest every Shabbat, right? Every seventh day, every Saturday, they're supposed to uh, rest from work. But every seventh year, they're also supposed to take a year off a whole year off. They weren't supposed to plant any crops. So if you obey Shabbat, make sure you take every seventh year off as well. Uh, you need to take your sabbatical uh, because that's that's the same command. Okay. Well, the problem is the Jewish nation never celebrated the, uh, the seventh year. They missed 70 of them. They missed 71 year periods of rest. So God said, as punishment, I'm going to take you out of the land and let the, the land rest for 70 years. Ooh. And that's where the 70 comes from. It's a punishment. It's a punishment, but it's also kind of like you, you failed in your covenant with me. And so that's, that's why 70. And Daniel read it and said, okay, so if it's 70 years and then we'll be restored, he starts looking at his watch and says, we're due. It's time. God promised. So if God promised, does he need to pray? We need to pray for God's promises. That's an important thing. If you see a promise in scripture, don't go like, well, I got it already then. How about you go before the throne of God and claim it? Go before the throne of God and plead with him for it. And 
bring your receipts, right? Lord, you said this. So please do this. And that's what we're going to see Daniel do here. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. What does confess mean? Confess means to agree. Okay. If the if the popo or the police say you you uh, did something, if you confess, you are agreeing with the charge, right? That's what confession means. Um, so when we confess uh, to the Lord, we are we're agreeing with Him that what He is saying is right. Ah, Lord, the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps His gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commands. He keeps covenant with those who keep his commands and love him. We have sinned, done wrong, acted wicked, wickedly, rebelled and turned away from your commands and ordinances. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to the kings, leaders, and ancestors, and all the people of the land. So God spoke to them again and again and warned them, but they didn't listen. Now, what Daniel wasn't in the land, right? I mean, Daniel wasn't the one who did these things. So why should he confess? And maybe you have that same idea, too. It's like, well, I'm not doing any of these perverted things that 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 the United States may be doing in mass or, or, or whatever your country is. You're like, I didn't vote for that, dude. I didn't vote for that party. So it's not my fault. And yet we see Daniel confessing the sins of his nation and, and, and his people. Now, don't get me wrong. We should start with a confession of ourselves. We should daily be confessing our own sins, okay? Not, you know, ignoring our own sins and just confessing the sins of our nation. But we begin by confessing our sins, but then we move on to the sins of our community and the sins of our nation. And if we confess the sins of our nation and seek for mercy from God, that's how we find it. We need to humble ourselves. And that's what we see Daniel doing here. He's confessing the sins of the people. There were many prophets who came and said, this is what you're doing wrong. And Daniel is saying, yeah, you're right. We did those things wrong. Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but this day, public shame belongs to us. The men of Judah, the residents of Jerusalem and all Israel, those who are near and those who are far, in all the countries where you have banished them because of the disloyalty they have shown toward you. Who's the bad guy in this? Is God the bad guy? No. We see that the people who are disobedient, disloyal, were the bad guys. And God was never betrayed. And we see Daniel laying that out. Lord, public shame belongs to us, our kings, our leaders, and our ancestors, because we have sinned against you. How often do people get upset with God when God didn't do anything wrong? People look around the world and say, look at all this wrong stuff happening around the world. Why does God allow it to happen? And the real question should be, why are humans doing it? Because that's the truth, isn't it? Why are there starving people in Africa? Because of corrupt, evil governments. That's why. It's not, not hard to figure that out. But people don't go, why are people doing this to each other? They go, why, why is God allowing this to happen? Who, who, is, who is responsible for something? The people doing it or the, or the people that are, um, you know, not getting involved necessarily? And, and there's good reasons not to get involved for things, right? Maybe you don't have the resources to do so. That's not God's problem, right? But unlike Americans who never really considered this one, but uh, there are consequences to getting involved, right? 
when you get involved, uh, potentially a lot of people could perish. And uh, that's something America never really seems to think through before it invades and helps people and spreads democracy everywhere, right? Uh, and, the, and the truth is God can fix all that's wrong with the world with a... He can. The problem is you and I are the problem. All of us humans here on earth are the problem. To fix the problem, all he has to do is just kill all of us. And he'd be right to do so. That's why people are like, why doesn't God do something? It's like, dude, you don't want God to do something. If God does something, realize you and I are the problem. As long as there's a single person on the face of this earth, there will still be sin and evil and wickedness. So the simple, the solution is simple. To get rid of the people. But obviously that has some consequences, right? And uh, nobody who is talking about God doing something ever really wants that consequence. Uh, they want something else done. They want to tell God how to do his business. That's uh, kind of the opposite of humility. Bossing God around. But how often does that take place in conversations? How long often does that take place even in prayer? We come in prayer and start telling God how he's wrong. And that is not a good place to begin your prayer. That is a place that God's going to have to break you of. Before, before any of the conversations in your prayer get taken care of, that humility needs to be brought into our lives. But we see that it is here present in Daniel's prayers. Lord, public shame belongs to us, our kings, our leaders, and our ancestors, because we sinned against you. These things happen to us because, because we did these things. We did this, and, and the consequences are here. And it's shameful what we've done, and it's shameful where we are now. Verse 9, compassion and forgiveness belong to the Lord, our God, though we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the Lord, our God, by following his instructions that he set before us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has broken your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Sounds like the beginning of Romans, doesn't it? The book of Romans talks a lot about how we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The promised curse. So we disobeyed, and there was a curse that was promised in the law. Written in the law of Moses, the servant of God has been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. It said that if they were disobedient, that they would be taken out of the land of promise. But it was also said that they would be brought back. He has carried out his words that he spoke against us, speaking of God, and against our rulers by bringing on us a disaster that is so great that nothing like it has uh, been done to Jerusalem has ever been done under all the heaven. They had a special position of closeness to the Lord, which meant that they had a special level of discipline brought upon them. Consequences. The closer you are to the temple, the closer you are to the throne, the more harshly you get are, are held accountable. You ought to have known better. That's why we see some of the disciples in the early church were punished with death for things that happen in, in all of our churches today. Why aren't the people in our churches today getting struck dead for the things that they're doing? The simple fact is when Jesus was in their presence, the Holy Spirit was doing miracles in their midst. They should have known better. And because they didn't, they were struck dead. Just like the, the temple and the tabernacle. When the people could see the glory of God, they were held to a higher account. And we who have the Holy Spirit within us will be held to a higher account than unbelievers and people who have not been entrusted with such things. So they were disobedient and they were punished for it. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us, yet we 
have not sought the favor of the Lord, our God, by turning from our iniquities and paying attention to your truth. So even in exile, the Jewish nation did not, by and large, repent. So the Lord kept the disaster in mind and brought it on us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all that he has done, but we have not obeyed him. Now, Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a strong hand and made your name renowned as it is to, to this day, we have sinned. We have acted wickedly. Lord, keep in keeping with all your righteous acts. May your anger and wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem your holy mountain, because of our sins and the iniquities of our ancestors. Jerusalem and your people have become an ab object of ridicule to all those around us. Because God stamped his name upon the Jewish nation, upon Israel, some of the shame that they're experiencing is also the shame of God. The ridicule that people ridiculed the Jewish nation back then was also ridiculing their God. And there's something to be said about our, our identity being merged with God. It means that we need to be disciplined, but it also means that we need to be restored. Therefore, our God, hear the prayer and the petitions of your servant Make your face shine on your desolate sanctuary for the Lord's sake. We're still your people. Not that we deserve that, but the simple fact is, if you don't deliver us as people, it's, it's going to look like you abandoned us. That you weren't able to save us. That's what he's saying, for the Lord's sake. Listen closely, my God, and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that bears your name. See, it's it's God's city that's laying in ruins. It's a bad look. For we are not presenting our petitions before you based on our righteous acts. We're not good people. We haven't done good stuff. We're not saying we put the right coins in the vending machine so we should get, get the right things out but based on your abundant compassion. Lord, hear. Lord, forgive. Lord, listen and act. My God, for your own sake, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. One, are you a person that when people think of you, they, they know you're a Christian? That cuts both ways, right? When you get caught doing something you ought not to, you say something you ought not to, people hold you to account because they're like, a Christian shouldn't say that. If you follow Christ, you should act like Christ, and you're not acting like Christ right now. And uh, believe me, I don't, I don't like that. I don't like being held to that account. I'm, I'm not as good as Jesus. I'm not as loving and compassionate as Jesus. I'm not as, uh, I'm not like Jesus as much as I ought to be. But there's the other side of it, too, that we are his. We belong to him. And for his name's sake, he will work through us. And he will work special things in us and through us. For his name's sake. God is self-interested in our success, not in our necessarily our wealth. Or, or other things that we may think of immediately as we think success. But our influence upon people for the kingdom of God, God is self-interested in that. It's not out of his... Um, it's not like God just feels bad for us and like, okay, fine, I'll let you influence some people for the kingdom of God. No, God is doing something great in our nation and in our in our lives and in our communities. Our nation may fall from invaders from the outside. It may not continue on in the same way that we've seen it. But God wants to do something in our hearts and in the people's hearts that he's going to use us to influence. God's kingdom will endure. God's kingdom will continue to move forward. 
But the question is, do we belong to him? Do we have we publicly chosen a side? That's what baptism is about. That's what telling other people that you're a Christian is all about, is publicly choosing a side. And when we do, then we should be praying for the kingdom of God. We should be interceding on behalf of others. Our prayers should be about God's will being done here on earth as it is in heaven. Let me pray a prayer of blessing over you. Lord God, I pray that you bless each and every one watching this video today. That we would pray like Daniel. That we would wrestle with you for the promises that you've promised. Help us to long as our highest good, not our comfort, but rather your kingdom. That the salvation you have brought to us, that you would bring to those we love, people near and far. That you would use us mightily here to bring peace. Not necessarily between people, but into their hearts. That they would be at peace with you. That our enemies would become our brothers and sisters. Lord, that your power would rain down upon us. That no matter what happens in our nation, that you would move mightily through us in our communities. Lord, I pray all these things in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. All right, friends, thanks for joining with us. Uh, tomorrow, we will be jumping into the, the prophecy of the 70 weeks. It's, uh, it's a pretty crazy and amazing one, like I said. Um, I look forward to jumping into that and having you there for that as well. I will see you guys again tomorrow. Until then, God bless you all.